we're going to be going through a big memory for R for the first talk, um, bridging the unproductive valley, building data products strictly without magic, um, and followed by data science serverless star with R and open fast. So this session is um, sponsored uh, by sponsor of the day is Russia, and the session sponsor is Syncra. So um, if Jing Chao or Austin, um, if you could please share your slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem, sure. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is uh, Jing Chao Sun from Memorage. Uh, so today uh, we are going to talk about the big memory for R. Uh, okay, so, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, this is actually a joint uh, uh, presentation uh, with Austin, from, uh, who is a research scientist from TGen, and also Dr. Kang from uh, Analytical Bioscience. And uh, uh, first, uh, uh, I will talk about the motivation for the big memory uh, for R. So R is actually very popular right now in a lot of different areas. However, as we are in the big data era, so uh, we, we are facing a lot of challenges for R. For example, the data is becoming bigger and bigger. And because of that, so we are having a very long execution time. And uh, that would incur a higher chance of crash or failure for a data pipeline. So in order to avoid the failure, uh, a lot of developers or scientists, they need to save the data frequently and load it back. So this IO will have a lot of, uh, cost a lot of time, especially when the data is large. And also, uh, uh, although R actually supports multi-threading right now, but there are a lot of uh, legacy code which do the processing in a sequential way. So that's another challenge. So all those kind of uh, previous uh, drawbacks actually uh, uh, is because uh, the computer architecture. So we have two kind of media. One one is uh, DRAM, another one is storage. So DRAM is very small uh, and also very very expensive. And uh, however, it has a very good benefit. Uh, it, it's extremely fast. And another kind of SSD. So they are large, they are cheap, and also they have the capability of persistency. However, they are very slow. So there is a huge performance gap between the DRAM and the uh, storage. So this will actually kill the performance, uh, especially when you want to save the data from DRAM to uh, storage in order to have persistency. And what we want to do is actually kill the IO process. So we want to make use of a new kind of uh, hardware called persistent memory in order to kill the IO between the DRAM and disk. So we will have a, a, a large memory capacity. We will also have a, a very good performance similar to DRAM. And the more important is that no application running on top of our software uh, need to be changed. So the new hardware is called persistent memory. This is the new hardware introduced by Intel uh, four years ago. Uh, it has very large capacity and also it's very cheap. Uh, it's much cheaper than DRAM and also have very similar performance. Uh, it's a little bit slower than DRAM right now, uh, but it's much, much faster than the SSD. And uh, what's more important than it has the capability of persistency, which uh, DRAM does not have the persistency. So, on top of this, this hardware, we have our big memory computing architecture like this. So at the bottom is the DRAM and PRAM hardware. So we will have a middle layer, so memory machine. So it's a software will help the users to manage the data in DRAM and PMAM. So the user's application, our application running on top of memory machine does not need to care about whether the data is in the PMAM or in the DRAM. You just uh, uh, write the code in your previous way and we will help you manage the data in the DRAM and the PMAM. So the usage is uh, very simple. You can use GUI and you can use also command line and also REST API to, to do that. And uh, what's the benefit? The first one is, uh, of course, you can enjoy a tiered, very large memory. So the memory capacity is the DRAM size and the PMAM size. And uh, as, you, as, as I introduced, so then could uh, support up to six terabytes per machine. So that's a huge memory, which, you, you, uh, which is not possible in current system. And we can put the hot data in the DRAM and cold data in the PMAP. So this will guarantee the speed. And we will also do the automatically uh, uh, swapping. So if the data become hot, we will put it in the DRAM. And if it's become cold, we will put it in the PMAP. Automatically, user does not need to worry about that. We also have a very flexible ratio 
of DRAM and PMAP. So user can adjust this ratio dynamically by themselves. If you if they are actually cost sensitive, you can use more PMAP and less DRAM. If you are performance sensitive, you can use more DRAM and less PMAP. So user can adjust this one uh, very easily. And uh, also in the future, we will also support remote memory, which means that you can use RDMA to use other machines memory in order to increase this memory pool dramatically. And another very huge benefit is uh, called snapshot, zero IO snapshot. As I mentioned, persistent memory has the capability of persistency, uh, which current DRAM does not have. So in current system, if you want to have persistency, you need to write the data from the uh, DRAM to the disk, and you will have serialization process, deserialization process, and also transfer the data from memory to the disk. However, because PMAM has a capability of persistency, we do not need to move the data from the memory to the disk. So the data in the memory already has the persistency. The only thing we need to do is just flash the data from DRAM and CPU cache to the PMAM. That's extremely fast. Just to finish it in seconds. And also, uh, if you want to take multiple threads, we only update the difference between two snapshots. So that's also extremely fast. And uh, if you want to restore the process, for example, for a uh, uh, process, you can take the snapshot of the process. If you later, you want to restore it. So you can just uh, restore that process and let it run again. And it can be restored into different namespaces. In this way, you can let this process running running in parallel, running multiple process in parallel. And also we supported the replication functionality. You can actually copy this uh, snapshot from one machine's memory to another machine's memory through network instead of IO. That's extremely fast. And also for some users who need this, uh, who need the files, so they can export this snapshot from the memory to the disk. Or we can also support that if, if the user want that functionality. So then I will talk about the application scenarios. Uh, so first it's very useful for the R jobs, which requires a, a huge amount of memory. And second, it's very useful for long running job. It can do some auto save. So if a job fails, you can restore from the latest snapshot. And also uh, it's very useful for uh, job debugging, especially when your job actually uh, need to run for a long time and then uh, it has a bug. So if you want to reproduce this bug, it will take a long time. However, if you take snapshots and you can just reproduce this issue in a very short time and easily. And uh, for a lot of other applications like iterative analysis, so you might uh, use machine learning models to uh, do a lot of work. However, you want to uh, train, uh, use the different parameters to try the final result. So uh, instead of using the, the loading the files from the disk multiple times, so you can just uh, directly restore it from the memory in seconds. So that would greatly reduce the time you spend on this one. And also, as I mentioned, then you can use restore to actually parallel your R job into different namespaces. And that would also accelerate uh, your process dramatically. And I think this is the, the, the basic introduction of our big memory framework. Uh, then I will just hand it over to uh, Dr. Kang to talk about his scenario and also Austin to talk about his uh, scenario. Uh, I will play the slides for, uh, for uh, Dr. Kang. Uh, if you want a full version of this presentation, you can find it here. So we will put a full version here. Hello. I'm really glad to be introducing our work at analytical biosciences about accelerating single cell sequencing with big memory technology in R. So uh, a little background about the single cell sequencing technology. It's a newly emerged technique in recent years that uh, we can profile the each, the, each of the transcriptomes and genomes of the single individual single cells. And it helps to answer a lot of important biological questions such as uh, what is the identity of cells, what are the different cell components in a microenvironment. So it's very typical for a disease like cancer to have a very, very complex microenvironment consisting of different cell types with dramatically different functions. So using this technology, we could also interrogate the functional characteristics of different cell types and uh, unveil some of the, the cell dynamics. Uh, for example, we could track individual cells, uh, their movements and their transitions into other cell types. 
And also, we could do some functional analysis on some important components, for example, the TCR and BCR sequences, which in turn uh, turns into antibodies that we can, our body uses them to target the pathogens. Using a number of techni techniques, which I will introduce later, we could uh, stratify the identities of these cells. And for example, I identify which genes are turned on or turned off during a development of tract where, uh, for example, the progenitor cells turns into mature types of cells. So uh, the general workflow of single cell anal analysis is like this. Uh, we use a number of mathematical uh, tra transformations and uh, a number of biological bioinformatics methods. So essentially, deep single cell analysis is largely data science with super high dimensions and intensive modeling. For example, we're facing like a, a matrix of a thousand or ten thousand genes and one million cells. This is very typical, and we would apply, uh, for example, feature selection techniques, dimensionality reduction, and uh, to further interrogate some of the higher level information of the cell. So uh, by using this big memory technology introduced by our friend at uh, Memberge, we did such thing to uh, transform our conventional workflow into a new memory machine based workflow where uh, each stage, instead of loading files and saving files like we do in the typical R scenario, we snapshot the R process and restore the R process. So uh, using this method, we could achieve second level restore for typical workloads compared to the conventional workflow where we typically experience, for example, uh, minutes of uh, overhead to dump the data into our data form or, and, for, uh, and further load it uh, for new iteration of the analysis. And uh, it's quite important to mention that uh, many of the steps need to be repeated for three to 10 times to test out the best or optimum uh, parameters. So that gives us even more waste in the time waiting for the data to write and load. So uh, we designed this benchmark strategy to uh, use our reference single cell workflow and test it on either the conventional work working environment versus the memory machine based environment. We have achieved some very promising result by using big memory technology. For example, uh, if we analyze a data set that's uh, 1 million cells in size, we could uh, achieve the full analysis within six hours. But if we switch to the memory machine platform and um, break up the different phases using uh, snapshots instead of file IO, we could eliminate the file IO overhead uh, and achieve the full analysis only in 2.5 hours. So this really uh, gives us more time to uh, really work on the true biology and uh, reduce the time to insight, which is uh, very important in some cases. For example, we want to get uh, results as soon as possible when we are analyzing some new data and some emergency data, for example, some COVID data we are currently doing at analytical biosciences. And apart from the file IO overheads I just mentioned, there are also other challenges uh, facing single cell data science and it calls for the evolution in R. For example, we are observing these exponential growth in number of cells per study uh, during the last few years. And, um, the most recent study has more than 2 million cells in size. And also there are uh, other modalities of data uh, apart from RNA. So we have single cell DNA data, single cell chromatin data due to the technological advances. So the growth of data is really extra exponential, but the max matrix elements in R is uh, restricted to this number because of the some of the hardware and source code of R. So if we try to uh, keep 
a matrix of 1 million cells, we would end up having only room for 2,000 features if the matrix is dense. And also, uh, such thing is such such matrix may only be twenty gigabytes in memory, but we could not allocate it due to the restrictions in R. So, and finally, uh, at analytical biosciences, uh, our goal is to enhance biomedical research with uh, cutting edge single cell technologies, including deep single cell profiling and. Uh, very in-depth bioinformatics analysis and the big data mining. So all of this is not possible if we don't have advanced computing and analytics power, which is also we're very excited to um, participate in this activity and use R and uh, share this uh, new technology with everyone. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, next I will hand over to Austin and I will play the slides for him. Okay, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Oscar Terres, and I'm a bioinformatician in Dr. Nicholas Banovich's lab at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about how we use big memory and R to study the genetics of a rare disease called IPF. Next. Uh, IPF is a progressive disorder of unknown cause that leads to respiratory failure and death. It's a rapidly progressive disease that will lead to either death or a lung transportation within the three to five years of diagnosis. And unfortunately, there's no known cure and the current treatments only slow the recursion of the disease with major side effects. Next. Uh, we use a technology called single cell mRNA sequencing to characterize the transcriptomic profiles of individual cells from 20 fibrotic and 10 healthy lungs. And this is just a general overview of the workflow before sequencing and our data analysis in R. Uh, next. And then after sequencing and initial processing in R, we use a dimensionality reduction algorithm called UMAP for both visualization and clustering. And every dot in this graph is an individual cell for which we have green gene expression counts for. And then after that, we manually classified each cell by its gene expression profile. And our data set contains nearly 40 cell types from the human lung, and each with its own distinct transcriptomic profile. Um, and then we identified four major cell populations, which are the immune cells, endothelial cells, mesenchymal, and epithelial cells. And today we'll be focusing on the epithelial cell population. Next. Uh, when we were classifying the cell types in the epithelial cell population uh, shown here on the left, we noticed a distinct population that couldn't be characterized by traditional gene markers. And we noticed this cell type was specific to fibrotic lungs. And this led us to believe it was a novel and uncharacterized cell, which we named the keratin-5 negative, keratin-17 positive cell type. And as you can see on the right, the gene expression profile of the keratin-5 negative cells do not match that of any other epithelial cell type. Next. And because the keratin-5 negative, keratin-17 positive cells were disease specific, we use fluorescent probes to bind to the keratin-17 gene in order to determine where the cells are located in the human lung. And then we saw that these cells localized near the fibrotic regions of the lung. And we think they played an important role in the progression and regulatory processes of pulmonary fibrosis. Next. And if you'd like to take a deeper dive into our analysis and results, you can check out our publication, which was featured on the cover of Science Advances nearly one year ago today. Next. And then now let's move on to the computational challenges we encountered during this analysis. Single cell data is generally stored as a matrix where rows are genes and columns are cells. And this matrix contains observed counts for genes inside every unique cell. In our data set, we had a matrix of 30,000 genes by 114,000 cells, which required a large amount of memory in R. In addition, our data set keeps growing in size, which means our memory computational requirements also keep growing in size. Next. Uh, in order to speed up this analysis pipeline, we're teaming up with members to accelerate our processing workflow. Our analysis pipeline took six and a half hours from start to finish because our pipeline is stubbornly single-threaded. But by utilizing, utilizing the snapshotting and cloning capabilities of memory machine, we were able to parallelize the processing of our pipeline. And as a result, we can now save nearly 36% of computational time while also taking advantage of the big memory Optane nodes. This will enable our team to save significant amounts of time for downstream analysis, and we're really excited to continue to work on this project together. Next. 
Can you wrap it up in about a minute, please? Yes. Yeah. All the code and data uh, is available for download on our GitHub page uh, at github.com slash tgen slash manage lab. And then next. And you can download uh, the full presentation at memverge.com. Thank, okay, you, thank you very much. Um, please give a hand to Jing Chao, um, Chris, as well as Austin. Now, due to time, we won't just ask a question, but we do have 10 minutes at the end of the session where like all the presenters will be there to answer your question. So please feel free to ask away more um, and we'll come back to the questions at the very end. Um, please welcome next, um, Max Held, who's gonna be talking to about bridging the unproductive valley. Max, please take away. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes, I can. You should, great, okay. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, my talk's about bridging uh, what I've dramatically called the unproductive valley, um, building data products strictly without magic. First, a little bit about the motivation. Um, perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, I'd argue that the reason we use R is for scalability. Now, R isn't exactly known for being super scalable, uh, but th that's referring to scalability at runtime. And uh, I think mostly in, in scripted data science, runtime isn't our biggest concern, but the limiting factor is development time. We usually don't have thousands and thousands of users in our dashboards or, um, or other data products, but our limiting factor is how fast can we get ideas for analysis um, from the developer's head or the data scientist's head uh, into code and then show the results to our stakeholders. And uh, I mean scalability here broadly. I don't just mean scaling by um, the, the, the roles in your data frame or, or what have you, but broadly for projects to become big and very productive. And for that uh, code needs to be very expressive I think this is what R is also, that's what it's famous for. It's not that the for loops are particularly fast or anything, but uh, it has a lot of idioms and native vectorization, a bunch of other things that so makes code very expressive. Onboarding should be fast for new data scientists to join a team. Turnaround should be fast, uh, meaning you should be able to add like new features relatively quickly. Uh, and then, of course, like any other uh, software project, it should be maintainable, it should be possible to pass on responsibility to someone else, take on new team members, etc. And here, I think um, we face a bit of a problem. And now, this isn't this graph is, of course, a little bit loosey goosey uh, because I, I don't have empirical data here. Uh, I'm charting here um, uh, the number of person hours that you'd contribute to any given project. Uh, on the x-axis and then the y-axis, the sort of the visible output or the output that your stakeholders care uh, about. Uh, and traditionally, you would get to some output if you're using something like Excel or maybe even Tableau or other sorts of sort of point and click software, um, you'd get to outputs relatively quickly. So this would be a pretty steep uh, curve at the beginning, but then it'll flatten off as sort of the complexity uh, eats up your productivity and, and you won't be able to deliver uh, that many more features or just it, it'll become too big, right? And so that's why we've always promised that for real data scientists, you need like, you need scripted data science as uh, for example, using R or, or Python. Uh, but I think this, this doesn't always work. Like we advertise it, but it doesn't always work. Uh, what always works uh, is that your initial output, the output that the stakeholders take, uh, are interested in is much smaller. Uh, so you always have this initial drop here in your productivity, not necessarily your real productivity, but the productivity that your stakeholders see, right? It takes more time to set things up. And then of course we do this because we promise that in the end, once we've added a little more then we'll get super productive and there'll be all these amazing uh, dashboards, et cetera, that we can give to our, and insights that we can give to our stakeholders. But sometimes this doesn't work out. And that's what I'm worried about. That sort of, we can end up, and, and it's a bit unpleasant, but I think we have to sort of consider it. There's a possibility that you end up in sort of the worst of both worlds. You have the high upfront cost uh, that comes with building real software as opposed to 
quick and dirty one-off scripts, but you also don't really scale um, if you have sort of poorly defined hack together uh, quick and dirty scripts, right? Uh, and I think this is the sort of the sell here, the high upfront cost and does not scale prototypes on our scripts that we really want to avoid. Because uh, quite honestly, for a lot of organizations, uh, if this is what they're faced with, they may be better off with either doing it in point and click software or in, in spreadsheets even, or if they need something that scales but cannot afford the high upfront cost, just use a software as a service. For example, this doesn't exist in sort of all industries, but Google Analytics would be maybe an obvious example, and, and there may be others in other industries. Um, and what we do want to be building is really what I, I'll call for the purpose of this presentation, data products as real software. Now, this sort of sounds a little bit um, too clever, and you might be asking, well, haven't we been doing this already? And what's this Max Held guy has to say about this? I'm not even a, a computer scientist by training or anything. The only thing I have is I have a lot of scars to show for it. Um, so if you look at a lot of my GitHub repos, towards the end of these projects, they all have commit messages like this. Oh, not all of them, but many have. So I, I've been doing this for a couple of years and uh, I have the scars to show for it of all these things um, maybe don't work out so well. And so Muggle um, is uh, our attempt um, at the University of Göttingen to sort of bring together the ideas that we've had uh, and, and, and try to wrap them up uh, and suggest to other people how maybe some, some things might work uh, better. Muggle is on the one hand, it's just an R package. Um, you can uh, find it uh, on GitHub and, and this is sort of the landing page. It doesn't do an awful lot. Mostly it's just a wrapper for relatively fancy Docker container, and it has a bunch of uh, setup and helping functions uh, on, along the lines of use this. Um, now, you might be asking, well, what, do we really need another one of those? There's a bunch of these helper DevOps types packages out there. Um, and just to briefly summarize how um, Muggle is different is we really do a lot less and we take this being non-magical very seriously. So other projects like uh, our end do a lot more and are a lot sort of impose a, a greater overhead and more things to worry about. They can also do a lot more. Um, we do a lot less. Um, we try to be very slim. So the Rocker project, which is an obvious sort of competitor has containers that are ready made for interactive use, but they are much more generic and as a result, much bigger. And then there's a whole bunch of um, uh, packages and sort of an ecosystem around uh, hole punch, hole punch and, and, and binder. And we try to also not do what they do, which is to infer developer intent. So we, we try to be very religious uh, about never inferring developer intent and never doing anything magical uh, and, and also never like polluting uh, the, the source tree with sort of boilerplate. Um, but we basically everything in our projects that is committed has been written by a human. Now, a lot of the stuff that I'll, I'll talk about is sort of run-of-the-mill software engineering advice, uh, not particularly original or, uh, or anything like that, just apply to R here. I, I really recommend the Pragmatic Programmer, which came out two years ago, I think, in a 20th um, anniversary edition by Thomas Hunt and Andrew, uh, sorry, David Thomas and Andrew Hunt, really recommend that. A lot of this is based on, on that. Now we have um, sort of three big lessons that I'll focus on that uh, Muggle Institutes. One is that everything we do is a package. We don't, in all of our data science practice, we try not to ever do one-off scripts or even dashboards, but everything we do, we, we make as a data product and we ship it as a package. So for example, this is one of the projects that we're uh, currently working on uh, and you'll recognize this website. It's a, it's a package on website and everything uh, we do sort of always lives in packages. Uh, and you can, um, unfortunately this doesn't work, can I click on the reference, not so important. Um, and there's been some debate about this kind of design, uh, the, the project as, a, um, as an R package thing. And we try to get around some of the problems of that approach is we don't ship data in the packages 
And we try to also have a lot of packages so that any given project has a very thin package, which really only does like user-facing things like uh, rendering uh, the output or creating a dashboard. But a lot of the sort of deeper business logic or data transformation happens in downstream packages that I'll talk about in a bit. Then the second thing we do, and this is arguably where sort of the meat and potatoes of of Muggle is, is we, we rigorously standardize our compute environment. And of course, the industry standard, as this old joke here uh, has it, is that this is, this is Docker. So the industry uh, answer to this problem is that it works on my machine. Um, so we'll just ship your machine, or in any case, uh, a container with the important parts. Um, now, our um, Docker image that we use in Muggle has a couple extra features. It's built on the R base image uh, that's produced by R Studio, um, simply because that has RSPM support built in and it's pretty small. A um, couple of things that we built on top is we have multi stage builds. So, uh, sort of like a Russian doll, we build like different versions off of this one base image. So, the smallest one is our runtime version. We ship that off to Azure and, and Google if we ever want to. Um, publish things and that of course needs to be very small. So that's our production image and we have a build time image. That's what's being used in CI CD has a bunch more uh, dependencies package down, test that. And then we have a dev time image, which also comes with our studio and use this, but at the core. So these all have the same system dependencies and they all have the same dependencies. We have unbuilt instructions, which is another neat feature that um, Docker has that I learned about only a year ago. Just you can give a Docker files on build instructions, which will get triggered once another image is based on this uh, Docker file. And of course, all of our projects are built on these uh, Muggle Docker files. And so these on build instructions get triggered. And the nice thing is that you'll see in the screen is that that leads to like really, a really, really small Git footprint because we don't have to copy paste a lot of boilerplate. Um, we locked on dependencies using RSPM, our studio package manager, which gives you like a snapshotting feature. I think you've just a date uh, and you'll get dependencies only from that date. We're pretty proud that we have very small production images. Uh, ours are 1.4 gigabytes usually for most of our projects in that ballpark, the production images. Uh, and if you take something like Rocker Tidyverse, that's 2.6 gigs because it comes with a bunch more packages, of course, that, but you may not need those uh, in any given product. Um, we cache our dependencies on GitHub Actions, which is usually like the, and, and also our knitter um, artifacts and that sort of stuff. And so we're pretty proud to get uh, a CI CD turnaround of less than five minutes for most projects. Um, the, what I mentioned is the, the small uh, file print. Um, this is basically everything you need to set up a project for R. You specify the version. Uh, that you want from Muggle, which uh, locks down uh, the Ubuntu version, the R version, and RSPM snapshots. Uh, and then you say, okay, I want the build time and the runtime. And in this case, because we're shipping this out uh, to uh, Azure, we also want sort of the startup command uh, for the Shiny app behind it. Now we make these images really reproducible because we also push them. We render them on GitHub Actions and we push them to a GitHub's package repository on every commit. So that even should these dependencies become unavailable, let's say RSPM disappears or what have you, I hope it won't, um, you can always get the complete uh, containers off of your package repository, in this case, GitHub Actions. So we think it's, it's pretty reproducible and easy to get started for people who are new on the team. And we use the exact same image in CI CD. This is GitHub Actions running inside this container, in this case, failing. Uh, we use the exact same images, the runtime versions uh, in production in our container as a service um, uh, vendor. So this is Azure. We've also used it on uh, Google Cloud. The exact same container. Um, this is the Shiny app in action running off of that container, off of Azure. And of course, that being a com container makes it really easy to debug things. Uh, you can just type Docker run uh, locally on your machine. And uh, you might recognize this output here. This is the output of a Flex dashboard page uh, spinning up. And then any output that the Shiny session would give uh, to the terminal, you would see right here. And you could then on your local machine 
point your browser to this URL and you'd see the app running exactly in the same compute environment as it would on Azure, uh, which has saved us a lot of headache. You can also, of course, explore it interactively and just get in the machine and get rid of all of this. Oh, it doesn't work on my machine, slightly different context, et cetera. Uh, I see that I'm almost out of time. I have uh, five minutes left, so I'll, I'll skip through the rest, for maybe two minutes so that uh, I get a chance uh, to see some questions. Um, so we also try to be really strict about functional programming uh, and really stick to this uh, design uh, dot tidyverse um, paradigm, build mostly pure functions, make sure they're all length and type stable and fail early. And we, we sort of build around this dictum from Rob Pike, that data structures are important, not algorithms, and that everything else follows. If you want to see like a really simple one, uh, how we built this, and that's sort of the typical kind of package that we built. We have one only, we have a package which so far does nothing but parsing in DOIs, digital object identifiers. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but like if you get all of that logic out of the rest of your packages and our data products for our uh, stakeholders, it makes life so much easier uh, to deal with this once. Uh, and we're really glad that we got to do this. Now to wrap up, is this still agile? Um, I think it is. The, the problem with agile is, is that often sort of you, and agile is misunderstood to mean that you're sort of building a car while you're driving it at 100 miles per hour down the highway. And that's not really agile. But we, sh we try to start with like really small but functional things, even if they're sort of just play things. And then we, we make them more sophisticated down the road. And then you, can, you don't have this trade-off of like building quick and dirty and building good. If you build something small, you can build a good and it'll still be a relatively quick turnaround. Uh, all of this requires some organizational changes too, I'm afraid. And it's sometimes hard to, to explain and argue for this, to explain to the stakeholders that prototypes are not the same as agile development, that sometimes it's better to be slow and, uh, than fast. And that tight focus and saying no to a lot of things is really important. We think, and, and I personally think it's really important to sort of break the cycle where you're always building technical debt and your stakeholder then gets impatient and wants more features. And so you build more technical debt. And then at the end, sort of at some point, it drips becomes a whole mess of spaghetti code that no one can deal with. And that's frustrating for everyone in the end. I think it's a hard lesson that uh, especially smaller organizations with smaller data teams such as ours, with just four or five people uh, have to learn. And it's it, it can be hard, but I think it's, it's worth it um, for the stakeholders. And also personally, I, I have to say, I feel like life is too short to build bad code. Like I noticed like with COVID and everything, it's like, we, I, I want to build things that I have like at least a shot that it'll still be useful in, in two or three years, maybe five years. I mean, that's, that's already long-term for software. So yeah, um, I'll leave you with that. Thanks so much. Uh, and let's see whether we get any questions in the remaining uh, two minutes. Otherwise, um, I'll yield my time to the next speaker so we can catch up a little bit. Doesn't seem like there's any questions. Did I miss any? No, it's okay. Thank you, Max. Um, it takes time for people to type, so we should probably give um, a chance. Um, I will. I want to ask a quick question before we move to the next speaker. Um, so with all this, I think it's great effort that you're putting in, um, and certainly there needs to be more reproducibility um, like that's solid. I guess one part I always get a bit afraid is that whether the reproducibility of these tools, like, you know, is it going to be maintained in the long run? So even if I commit to this, can I use this actual tool five years later? Yeah, that's oh. fair. The, the answer is just that you don't need Muggle. Uh, so the Muggle, the package only has setup functions. So it, it only has stuff like use this, right? So you can say use this, use Muggle, but that'll essentially just paste these four lines of Docker file uh, into your project. And so if I get hit by a bus and no longer use Muggle, doesn't matter because the container is still out there. Um, admittedly, to update to new versions of R and to change the RSPM snapshot date, someone has to rebuild sort of the upstream image. But if you have someone in your organization uh, who knows their way around Docker a little bit, uh, it would be, I think, pretty easy to do to adapt this. And, and that's what I was saying, that Muggle isn't really like much of a package. 
Um, it, it doesn't really do anything. I just, I'm, I'm lazy. And so I, I sort of document everything I do as a package. And so this became a package, but it's more of a way of thinking about a uh, project uh, and, and having a place where to write these things down. And, and one example of what we think is a pretty good way to use, to use Docker. But um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, certainly Muggle hasn't sort of, doesn't anywhere near the sophistication that a lot of these other projects have or longevity to justify uh, sort of people taking a big bet on this. I, I'm aware of that, but you, you, you shouldn't need to ideally. Mm. Oh, I'd love to pick more of what you think. Um, so we'll come back to this in the question time. Um, so for now, let's move on. Thank you very much, Max. Um, so next one, um, Jyoti, if you could share the video for Peter's talk. Have you ever wondered if you should try running your R scripts as a serverless function? Have you followed tutorials and wondered if there is a better way? I did, and I'm going to share with you what I've learned along the way and how I made serverless data science a little bit better than I found it. I'm Peter Solomos, biologist, data scientist, and co-founder of Analytium. I build data analytics pipelines and web applications using R. I value resilience, freedom, and simplicity, and I expect data engineering solutions to align with these values. Let's see what I mean by that. But first of all, why bother? What is the most common reasoning for a serverless architecture? This is what I call a coupled analytics architecture where the front end is server-side rendered and is in constant communication with the back end. This is the design behind Shiny and is best suited for exploratory applications that involve a lot of reactivity at the level of the data. You can see here that cost is proportional to the resources required by the front and back end combined. This can easily lead to a constant margin. Other applications do not require the same kind of reactivity and statefulness. As a result, we can get away with fewer round trips between client front end and back end. Imagine a Plumber API as the back end and static HTML or any JavaScript framework as the front end. We can push most of the reactivity to the client side. Decoupling of the back end analytics from the front end also means now we are not bound to bootstrap and can optimize the bundle utilizing tree shaking, code splitting, and lazy loading. After these convincing arguments, let's see what do I mean by resiliency. Here's a backend API, a microservice. It has two endpoints. The first depends on packages one and two, and the second function depends on packages two and three. We might use Plumber for this API. As you make changes to the first endpoint, you update package two. This breaks endpoint number two. Of course, if you use unit tests, this will never make it into production. But even in that case, you have to fix bar before you can send it to production. That's extra work fixing something that worked perfectly fine before. What if we used containers to isolate the two functions? Updating foo has no impact on bar. This is where Docker and similar container technologies come into the picture. Docker provides immutability for the image layers. This makes it easy to version images, test and release, or even rollback changes. You can even deploy both versions to roll out gradually or to experiment. Isolation prevents conflicts that you saw a moment ago. It also simplifies managing resources at the container level such as memory or CPU limits. You can read more about the state of container technology in R from this paper by Daniel Nust et al. Next is freedom, free as in free speech. Here are the three largest cloud providers and a very brief summary of their function as a service offerings. Note also that each of these vendors has its own CLI, that means there's an R package wrapping that CLI. This leads to repeated efforts 
and makes migration less straightforward. I see both of these as potential risks. As an owner, I have less control over costs. As a consultant, I'm niching down into a segment defined by a vendor. What is common in all three is that there is no R runtime. Therefore, you have to use containers. Managing containers at scale is not trivial, and managing serverless infrastructure is also often outsourced to public cloud providers. This is where OpenFast comes in. The OpenFast project was born to mitigate these problems and to avoid vendor lock-in. OpenFuzz is an open source framework to deploy functions and microservices anywhere at any scale. The project was created by Alex Ellis and is maintained by the OpenFuzz core team and the community. OpenFuzz has an emphasis on Kubernetes, it provides auto scaling metrics, an API gateway, and it is language agnostic. So, what's Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a container orchestration engine for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. As you can see in this graph, the cluster consists of a set of worker machines or nodes that run containerized applications. The worker nodes host the pods that are the components of the application workload. The control plane manages the worker nodes and the pods in the cluster. OpenFuzz is great at abstracting away unimportant details and creating a simple multi-cloud experience where the user is still in full control. Let's outline what function we are going to build. The function takes some request parameters, based on that retrieves data from an API that contains daily COVID-19 case counts based on the Johns Hopkins University's global data set. Then we fit an exponential smoothing time series model to these observations. Finally, we make a forecast and send a response containing these expected values and prediction intervals around them. This is what the observed case counts look like for Canada and the white lines and blue ribbons indicate forecasts done with two different subsets of the data. So we want the function to return the numbers that we can use to draw the white line and the blue ribbons. Step zero, set up your cluster. This can be a local cluster using KinD, Kubernetes in Docker, Minikube, or K3S. It can be a managed Kubernetes offering by one of the many cloud providers, or it can be a server with the lightweight FASD, which is a stripped down single node cluster. Check out the open fast docs for instructions and tutorials. Next step is to install the fast CLI. It is available for different operating systems, including Windows PowerShell 2. This is the step where the instructions deviate from all other templates. Instead of a Go, Node, or Python template, we are going to pull templates for R. Templates are in the analytium slash open fast rstats templates GitHub repository. We can use the fast CLI template pool command to do this. There are 18 templates based on the parent Docker image and the framework being used. You can choose between three parent images. The Debian based rocker R base represents the bleeding edge. The Ubuntu-based R Ubuntu is for long-term support, and it uses RSPM binaries for faster R package installs. The Alpine-based R Hub R Minimal has the smallest image size. Think of 36 max. STDIO passes in the HTTP request via standard input and reads the response via standard output. Other HTTP frameworks like uh, HTTP UV, Plumber, Fiery, Beaker, and Ambiorix are all packages that you can find in the R ecosystem. Each of these frameworks has its own pros and cons for building standalone applications. Let's pick Plumber with the R base image. Plumber is one of the oldest of these frameworks. It has gained popularity, corporate adoption, and there are many examples and tutorials out there to get you started. 
Now that we made the decision of which template to use, the next step is to create a new function. The template naming follows rstats parent image server framework pattern. We define two environment variables, one for the Docker hub username or any other registry prefix. The second is the IP address or domain name for your open files cluster. We pass the template name, the function name, and the prefix as CLI arguments. I'm sure you started wondering if I'm going to ever show R code at this R conference. Here you go. This is the handler.r file inside the newly created COVID forecast folder, which is going to be the name of the cloud function. According to the familiar plumber annotation, following hash star, we define an endpoint at the root. Plumber will pass URL parameters to the function as arguments. Inside the function, we do some type conversion and call the COVID forecast function that spits out the forecast information that will be formatted as JSON as part of the response body. You can see what parameters can be passed to the function. If your handler requires extra packages, you can add those to the description file. Here we import forecast. For other use cases, you might need to add remotes, system requirements that will be installed into the Docker image before attempting to install our packages. You can also pin our package versions. Finally, we are ready to build the Docker image, push it to the Docker registry defined by our prefix, and deploy the function into the OpenFast cluster. You can do all this with one op command or you can do it in three steps, especially if you want to test the Docker image locally before pushing and deploying. When all this is done, it is time to invoke the function. Go to your openfast URL slash function slash function name, provide some parameters, and this is the JSON you can use on the front end to provide a numeric summary or draw an interactive graph. If you got excited about replicating this example, head over to openfuzz.com slash blog slash R templates, where I have recently written up this as an example. To recap, use the fast CLI to create a new function, edit the handler.r file, Put here also data you might want to load for a scoring engine and so on. Define the dependencies. Build, test, push, and deploy. Once the cluster is ready, you can invoke the function. We all know how well R is suited for data science due to its diverse tooling and its ability to leverage and integrate with other languages and solutions. I believe that R can truly shine in the multilingual serverless landscape. Thank you for listening to me talking about serverless data science in R using OpenFAS. You can find and read about the R templates for OpenFAS in these GitHub repos and find examples at Enlithium OpenFAS RStats templates and our stats examples. Feedback and contributions are much appreciated. Cheers, and let's open the floor for questions. Thank you, Peter, for your talk. Um, so Peter, I have also a question um, for you. Um, so it looks like really useful. Um, OpenFast seems to be actually quite professional. May I ask how long it's been um, going on or is it quite a still a new product? Uh, OpenFast started in 2016, so it has quite a bit of history and it's also a CNCF uh, incubated project. So it has some backing from a foundation and it's unlikely to totally disappear. And I've started our templates in 2019. I've been thinking about like a year before that, but I just got to that because I needed it. And uh, so it went through, I think, two iterations so far, and I'm looking at how to even streamline more. And I particularly like the, the Muggle uh, images that I have to look into because just uh, 
image sizes. That's my pet peeve. And uh, I like to make them slim. Mm, that was going to be my next question, whether you can actually use Muggle as one of the um, possible in placement of Rocker. I need to look so, at that, but yeah. So whenever I really need to slim down images, I'm using uh, the R minimal, although installing all the dependencies is not always easy uh, with Alpine Linux, but uh, it is quite doable. It just takes more upfront time. Mm. So you said it's for um, the ones that you showcased was an R example. Does this actually work with other languages as well? Uh, as long as you have um, a Docker image, which uh, in just some HTTP request, yes. So there's a little um, watchdog, which you insert in front of it, which runs the executable. And uh, that's how you kind of manage uh, the life cycle. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so we have a question from Anna. So thanks for the talk. How do you manage dependencies of packages that you need to import? Are the packages that you define in the imports also installed when the image is built, as well as the dependencies? Yes, um, this is kind of a gray area, especially when it comes to the system dependencies themselves, because then you have these build time and runtime things, and you might need to do some cleanup. Uh, but I, I like this explicit approach of the user or developers should define what they want. And uh, that can be a lot less than, for example, what our env picks up and that shows in the uh, sizes of the images. So I think if you keep adding and it runs as expected, that's the, the optimal size or kind of dependency structure you need. So you can start broader and then kind of take it away. But then if it's already running, why spend more time? So at least to me, there are some really um, like obvious dependencies that you would state and three or 10 lines, it's not a big deal to just put it in a uh, description file. And then you might run into some issues when you're building a Docker image and then you just basically read what the error says and add that line. So it's really straightforward. And I think uh, the, the description file is a really good way of doing that. The only downside is that it's not very easy to pin package versions because for example, remotes doesn't um, like support that out of the box. So for example, if you state those version information, it is not going to just do it. So that's why I had that extra line, which is not standard um, description file notation, but I just added that. So if I happen to know that one of the package uh, updates break my app, which happened to me in the past, I don't really care if other packages have been updated as long as they work as expected, but I know that particular one, I need 1.4.2. And that's how I got around that. Hope this makes sense. So I'm trying to be like really specific where I have to, but I also other places I just leave like it up to the major R version to, to install whatever latest package that came with it at that time. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Um, so we are at 4.30, so I invite um, Austin as well as Jin Chow to turn on your video. Um, we have now questions that you can direct to any of our speakers in the session. Um, so we do have one more question for you, Peter. Um, so uh, Pedro is asking, is there support for singularity? Uh, that is like a Docker-like uh, container version. I think I've seen that, but I, I can tell for real um, how that's handled within OpenFast. I'm pretty sure some people have already run into this, so I wouldn't be surprised if there, there would be support for that. Okay. Um, so Pedro also asked a question earlier I, um, for the uh, very first speaker, I think when um, uh, Chris was giving his video. 
Um, and already, I believe Jing Chao has answered it, but just so that it is streamed, I will ask again. So if you could re-answer that question, Jing Chao. Um, so Pedro asked, can this type of memory easily um, plugged into nodes or even classical PCs without charging the machine configuration? Uh, uh, so some of the machine configurations need to be changed. So, but that's very easy change. And also, uh, uh, it, it needs some recent CPUs. So Intel actually released uh, the, all the CPUs uh, in recent generations, which support the persistent memory. And it can be directly inserted into the DIMM, so which is exactly the same slot as uh, DRAM uh, right now. So that slot can be inserted as DRAM and also the, the PMAP. Yes. So I hope that answers the question um, for you, Pedro. Um, I can see some people are typing away um, on Slack. Oh, and here you go. Um, so Peter, what is the URL of the blog at OpenFast that has a fast template? So maybe if Peter, you could um, either put, answer that one on Slack. Yes, I'll do that. That'll be fantastic. I can see more questions coming because there's some typing going on, um, but it probably takes a while for people to type away. Um, for attendees as well, um, if you would like to ask your questions um, in person, like speak it out, if you raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can ask in this, in this Zoom session as well. Th thanks, Peter, and thanks, Amy. So I've asked, a, I've asked a question about installing the R packages and you gave me the, the, the answer. I'd be really curious to see your the, this this description file because I, I I've been having issues with installing our packages by using AMI on AWS, which I know that you've uh, told us, you know, you, you told us a d different way of doing things. And the only issue is that sometimes when you install packages, it doesn't return an exit, a non-zero exit when you install the packages. So I'm wondering, like, um, I, I found that adding just the packages in the description file is not enough and I'm using an install um, script where I specifically install all the packages that I need. Um, I'm wondering whether you have some other comments about um, around that or if what what you've been telling me before it's gonna be enough and I have to try different ways of making sure that all the packages that I need are actually installed. I don't know if my question makes sense, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a question to me, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm pretty sure Max could answer some of this, uh, maybe as well as I could, but uh, I agree that sometimes when you just keep adding packages, they might still not install because it's usually not another R package that is missing, but maybe a system dependency. And there are two kinds of system dependencies and Jeron Ooms made a really good like a package and the related vignette about this, how to spot which are build time dependencies, which you need to be able to build the package, and which are runtime dependencies, which the package keeps calling because it has some dynamic linkages to it. And most often I run into these issues when some of these build dependencies are missing. So the package can't compile and that can even happen when uh, you are using um, like a wrong, ro like somewhat off compiled. I don't know how to best frame it, but sometimes with RSPM binaries, you install them and they just won't work. And I've run into this in the past. That means you need to specify the package somewhere else, or you just have to wait until like everything builds. But what I found works best is in this case, when you want to rebuild the package from source, but you just want everything else that, that works, just install from RSPM, is to have as imports, which is going to use RSPM, and then maybe refer to the dev package on GitHub, which is then going to be built from source. And this is how I usually deal with these types of things. But then you also have to go to these databases and, and look up those dependencies for your specific like Linux uh, OS that you are using. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
Gibida, and thank you, Anna, for your question. Um, so we have a question from Dennis, actually, which was one that I was also thinking about. Um, so Dennis says um, to Max, sometimes it's hard to get people to change their behavior. How was you, um, uh, how does your opinionated framework receive, was received? Um, how did you sell it? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the the struggle is real and it's uh, it's still ongoing. Um, I, I'm in a bit of a lucky situation uh, that we're working at the university libraries and, and we sort of have a mandate to publish open source stuff. So there is some time to work on these kinds of things. Um, I think the best thing that's worked was showing um, my colleagues how sort of once I've migrated an, an existing project to this framework, or it's not really a framework, once I applied sort of these best practices, I, I should be clear about like Muggle is, it's just, I put it in a package because I put everything in a package, but it does very little. So there's not, this won't like get into your project. It, it won't even be in your description. So there's very little that you have to adapt. It's more of a way to like put these best practices in one place and and have a hopefully decent practice with with docker images but what was really helpful in selling it is um sort of having a package that was previously just it wasn't even a package it's just like a bunch of scripts that people had to like source and then source this and then you have to pray and like hope that it's a full moon and then maybe like the shiny app will work uh, and what people really liked when I had migrated that was looking at the diff and how much smaller the package had gotten once all of this cruft that was in Git that wasn't really, uh, that no one really knew what that was for and it wasn't well the, like documented once all of that was gone. I think that was sort of for the other developers where, um, or data scientists are sort of a, a light bulb moment that like this stuff can make projects so much smaller. And I think um, that's something that, that that is hard for us as data analysts and data scientists also to learn and to, to try to convince our colleagues is that ideally, I think the stakeholder facing product, data product, whether that's uh, a shiny dashboard or an R markdown thing or whatever, should be very thin and it almost like it shouldn't really matter whether it's our markdown or shiny they, they, because it's so thin and only the interactivity or if it's shiny the reactive graph is in there and all of the other stuff is like in other packages uh, and 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 i think that can help like showing people okay this like recombin recombining stuff like the and the unix philosophy it really works for uh, for data products that you have that you try to like outsource the kinds of things that you're using in your organization across several different projects. You outsource that to its own package, which is one thing. And then by recombination, uh, you get a lot faster and your user facing or stakeholder facing products become a lot smaller. I think that's, that's helped. But I think the ongoing struggle where I, to be honest, have also failed is um, to explain that slow is fast and that you have to say like that you have to say no a lot and and try and keep the focus tight and this is sort of a personal opinion but um sometimes i worry whether uh we're just living through something that has affected software engineering uh, or uh, software companies uh, in general which is that if you're like very small and you don't focus you fail and i think there is a risk that sort of, I mean, we've already had a bit of a hangover with some of the AI and ML hype and that we'll get more hangover of failed scripted um, data science products if after two or three years of spending a lot of money, we don't deliver a lot of value. And, and I think sort of the tight, tight focus might be, might, not having that might be really dangerous. Yeah, so I don't, uh, I hope that answers your question. I, the struggle is, is ongoing. Um, I think it's real. The benefit is real. And I, I want to be very clear that it's the Muggle doesn't really do much. It's like, it's just a place to document this. And, and these are sort of me too wisdoms, maybe except for the Docker container, which has some fancy stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, Dennis. Uh, I wanted to add to, add, um, to uh, um, Anna's question, just two 
Now, it's, I've used two services to identify system dependencies in Muggle. Uh, the old one that I've now gotten back to is uh, R Hub, uh, which also has an R package that you can provide with your platform identifier and your um, uh, the package you're using, and then it'll give you back uh, like a bunch of install instructions. And the other one is linked to uh, RSPM, which also has uh, a list of uh, system dependencies, runtime system dependencies, I should say, in both cases. Thank you very much, Max. Um, so we'll close the session now. If you have any questions, please feel free to put it um, on Slack so you can continue to interact. Um, so again, I want to give thanks to the sponsor of the day, Russia, and session sponsor to Synchro. And thank you to our speakers as well as our audiences for all your questions. Hope to see you next time. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care.